would you break down or just kind of give like a small little synopsis on what exactly neuroscience is so that people kind of have a grasp and understanding for what it is you study and why it's so important? Sure. So and well, and before I even get into that, just to wrap up this topic, I think it's important for people to know that stress and anxiety impact, especially chronic stress, impact your hormones in your body, right? So yes. you have low testosterone or you have reproductive issues as a woman, one of the most, if not the most common cause of hormone in imbalances and reproductive issues is chronic stress. And um, right. we know this with infertility. Infertility, like 50% of infertility is caused by anxiety, right? But if you get sent to an infertility specialist that doesn't do therapy or mental health work, then they're going to say, oh, well, you need to do all of our fertility procedures to get to have a baby uh, or to have any chance of having a baby. And that could include invasive procedures like egg harvesting or hormonal treatments or any of these things. But they're missing the fact that your body is in a stress state. And when you're in a stress state, guess what? There's no blood flow going to your hormonal systems and your reproductive system. Your reproductive system is literally deprived of resources, starting with blood. So why would it function properly? Right. Like it's silly for us to even consider based on the way that, neuro, that that we know now that the body works, that your reproductive system should not be functioning properly when your body mind perceives that you are running from a lion. Right. You don't want it to function when you're running from a lion. So your body's doing what it was designed to do. It's just that stress has hijacked it. And the idea of stress being, oh, this is actually dangerous. So so that's neuroscience, really. And, and we know this because of neuroscience. So neuroscience is a field that has been around for quite some time, um, I guess probably about 100 years um, in the modern neuroscience. Uh, that, and what it is, it's a study of the brain and the body and how the brain and the body are connected and how nerve cells, the brain's core cells that connect information from one part to another, um, are able to talk to each other and and basically entrain learning and information. And um, I actually, and neuroscience could be any number of different things. It can be practiced in a lab, which is how I started. And that's how um, most commonly people think about neuroscience is a bunch of people in, you know, white research lab coats doing experiments on animals or cells. Um, I did that for about eight to 10 years. And uh, then there's neuroscience on the human level where we're actually studying how people how people's brains work um, using brain imaging and bi biological techniques uh, that act that help measure the nervous system, EEG, brainwave measurement, things like that, body measurement, heart rate and respiratory rate, and all these functions of the body can be used to help us understand the brain better. Um, so those are all different neuroscience practices. Um, I am actually uh, fairly unique in that I am a translational neuroscientist. So what that means is I don't work at the bench anymore. I'm not in the lab and I do work in the clinic with my patients, but my focus is on how do we literally translate the great discoveries we've made in the lab and then bring them into the community and bring them into clinical care. And how do we change the way we treat patients? How do we change the way we live from all the incredible discoveries we made over the last hundred years, most of which had never actually been fully integrated into the way we live and the way we practice medicine. Um, which I noticed when I was in the lab. I'm like, why are these things, why are these great discoveries not moving forward into changing the way we work? And they just weren't. There's all these block blockers along the way. So um, one of the main ones is how do we describe the findings and how do we create new tools? Uh, Apollo being the first translation that we did um, from our work from the lab into the clinic and into the real world. But how do we literally translate what we learn from the lab into a language that everybody can understand? Um, and so that's kind of my specialty is on the translational neuroscience side. Yeah. Cause that's true. I mean, cause that's, it's a little bit more complex of a, a concept to say the least. So I'm, I'm sure that you're good at breaking things down and explaining to patients. Do you find that it, it's hard for them to kind of follow and understand like what you find, or do you think that people are kind of receptive and understanding? Do you struggle with that or how does that work for you? I mean, I think everyone tends to want to know how their brain and body work, right? Like, have you ever yeah. met anybody who yeah. really just doesn't want to know, you know? So I think like most people want to know. No. I think the, yeah. the challenge has always been, 
how, what words do we use to teach them? Right. How do we teach them? Right. And, you know, like Einstein brought this up back when he was alive, which was, you know, if he, he used to say something like, if you can't teach something to a, a five year old, or, or seven year old, I can't remember the age, but it was something under 10. Like if you can't teach something to a person of a, a young age, it's not the fault of the per person trying to learn. It's not the fault of the learner. It's the fault of the teacher and not to, mm -hmm. to explain things adequately. And I thought that was really interesting because he kind of brings up this topic of language as an evolving, active, dynamic thing that it's up to us as the teachers to come up with better ways to meet our learners where they are and explain things in a language they can understand. And so I really took that to heart because I had people in my training who did that and who taught me things in a language I can understand. I had people who did the complete opposite and just talked about things the way they understood it and made it really complicated. And I am, you know, I am an, I am an MD, PhD. I'm a neuroscience and a psychiatrist. And, um, I still struggle to understand what some of these guys were talking about. Guys and gals were talking about. So it's not unique. Right, to, right. It's not unique to you, if you, as a listener, that you might have a hard time understanding this. Some of this stuff is really, really freaking hard to understand. So for me, yeah, it's almost like a it's almost like a game to figure out how can we find the words right and develop our personal language skills better and expand our vocabulary to meet an individual, a learner, where they are, wherever they are. They could be a child, young child. They could be somebody who just graduated from high school or is in high school. They could be somebody who is an older adult who grew up, you know, 70 years ago, who has no frame of reference of the kind of things that we face every day in the same way that we do. Point being that we have to meet the learner where they are. And so, you know, it's, it's fun to try to figure it out. Um, how do I describe what you want to learn to you in the words that you can understand.